This is podcast number 24, and in this podcast, we're going to talk about uh, DNA evidence in terms of human genome evidence, what that can tell us about race and what it can't tell us about race, and that uh, that give you the evidence that shows that there is really no signal in the genome, in the human genome for race. So before I get started, um, it's very tricky for anybody uh, to be talking about race, and uh, especially in the these last couple weeks of uh, the summer. I can tell you that uh, my intention in here and the intention of the authors of this book is to show you what the data are uh, about race and what they aren't about race so that you have a good argument when people try to use science to back up racist sorts of arguments. But uh, I may stumble and I may say something that you find offensive. Uh, certainly that's not my intention. If, uh, if I do, please let me know so that I don't make that mistake again. Okay. Um, in early research on human evolution, uh, there were uh, a couple of hypotheses uh, talking about how humans evolved and how different races evolved. Um, because I want to emphasize the idea that there is no genetic uh, signal in race. I'm only going to talk about the prevailing hypothesis, the one that's supported by data, and that is the out of Africa hypothesis. And this is the idea that humans evolved uh, once in Africa and then a small subunit of humans migrated uh, out of Africa, a uh, small subunit maybe, maybe as small as 10,000 humans migrated out of Africa and uh, about 100,000 years ago, and they populated the uh, planet. Uh, there is a study done uh, on mitochondrial DNA sequence in humans. So as we talked about when we talked about meiosis and fertilization, when a sperm enters the egg, the mitochondrial DNA does not go with it. So in the last podcast, or, or a recent podcast, you learned about how uh, mitochondria have their own DNA, and that DNA looks like prokaryotic DNA, and the mitochondria in a sperm head don't transfer into the egg, so all a person's mitochondria comes from their mother and not from their father. There is a couple super rare exceptions to that, but as a general rule, that's going to be the case. That's going to be true. So uh, if you're trying to figure out how people are related to each other um, by looking at DNA sequence, and it's uh, if you just look at mitochondrial DNA sequence, you don't have to worry about crossing over. You don't have to worry about recombination, any of that stuff that could mix up the order of the sequence if you're looking at nuclear DNA. So mitochondrial DNA only is inherited through the mother and so can be a simpler signal to look at. And when they uh, used mitochondrial DNA and built a phylogenetic tree of all these different populations of humans, uh, they got uh, populations uh, that are currently non-African, so everybody came out of Africa, that's the idea, but currently uh, Chinese people um, are mainly in uh, China, although everybody is uh, spread all over the place, but where they were sampled was in China and not uh, currently in Africa. And then, uh, uh, and they were um, distinct from people who currently live in Africa in uh, this mitochondrial DNA tree. There was a um, group of samples um, that was a sister group to the rest of 
the uh, non-African world uh, that were still in Africa. So this is thought to be more closely related to um, uh, other humans in the rest of the uh, world than other Africans in Africa by how you would read these trees. And again, these are bootstrap numbers. You can think of them as confidence limits. And what percent of the trees that they drew using different assumptions um, came up with this, what's called topology, this shape of a tree. Okay, And 100% of the time, you get this kind of a split. 98% of the time, you get this kind of split. Okay, um, so uh, here is this, uh, where they got samples um, and uh, how many samples they got. And you can see that it doesn't represent the whole world. Um, nobody from Canada, uh, for example, uh, very, very few from um, uh, Eurasia and not many throughout Europe. So uh, all people were not sampled. Uh, in this sample. And so you can take that study with a grain of salt because if they had sampled more people they might get different results. And in fact there's a new study that is similar to this um, every few years uh, that follow the out of Africa hypothesis. There were other uh, species in the genus Homo. We are Homo sapiens but there's Homo neanderthalus Talensis, um, there's Homo denisovans, um, uh, I'm saying that wrong, uh, but there are other closely related uh, non-human primates, and there's some good evidence in, from recent studies that in the small group that left Africa, they uh, interacted and mated uh, with uh, some of those um, non-Homo sapiens, uh, and we can see that in modern DNA studies. Okay, um, so this is the uh, hypothesis about um, how humans spread across the globe out of Africa. Um, if we look at the whole genome uh, of a human, there's 3.2 billion base pairs. Uh, it's a rounded to 3.2. Um, that's uh, 3.2 A's, C's, G's, and T's, uh, if you sequence the whole thing. Um, 3.1968 of that is I absolutely identical between one person and another person. So 99% of the DNA between one person and another person uh, is exactly the same. And 3.2 million base pairs are typically variable between one person and another person, but that's only uh, a difference of 0.1% of your total DNA is going to be different between one person and another person. Uh, and of those 3.2 million differences, 2.72 million, uh, so 85% of the 0.1%, could be associated with a population or a race. So um, uh, some of these arguments are sort of complicated. I'm going to try my best not to flub explaining these. Okay, so overall 0.015 percent of all a human's DNA is limited to populations. So if you're trying to say on like those uh, commercials you might see on TV for 23andMe, it says, I thought I was German, but I found out I am Dutch, uh, and I'm 22% Dutch or something like that. Um, they're only talking about a very small amount of the uh, genetic information that is variable among people, and they're making a whole bunch of assumptions. There's no way that anybody can say they are 22% this or 18% that because those are social constructs and those are based on self-reported data, people who are self-reporting their own race and, um, and, and then there's a complicated formula that they use. So basically it's baloney that somebody says 
I'm 22% this or I'm 18% that based on those tests. Okay, so if we consider uh, people who self-identify as black, white, Asian, or, or Hispanic, and we look at their DNA and look at how diverse it is and say, what DNA do they share and what DNA is different? And we draw a Venn diagram. You can see all four of these are right on top of each other, and they all overlap. So some individuals may have uh, some specific spots in their DNA uh, that have been identified as race specific. Some individuals will not have anything that is identified as race specific. And it's very unlikely that any individual will have all the race specific variants. So this is, this is getting, this is where it gets sort of complicated because it sounds like I'm arguing for two different things. If you look at every, the sum total of someone's DNA and you look at how much of that DNA overlaps with somebody else and how much of that is variable, um, all this is true in that there is more variation within someone who self-reports as white or someone who self-reports as black than there is between uh, people who self-report as black and see people who self-report as white. There is no spot in the DNA that you can say, this gene makes me white or this gene makes me black. That doesn't exist. Um, however, there are in groups of people that self-identify as black or self-identify as white or self-identify as Asian, there can be specific um, gene sequence differences. They're called single nucleotide polymorphisms. That means at this one base pair, there uh, is a variation in that some people have an A here, some people have a C here. And there are examples of single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, that are associated with people who self-identify as one particular race. Um, but there's so much variability that uh, there's no saying that if you do have that variation at that one spot, that makes you Asian, or if you don't, that makes you Asian. Um, it's just not true. Okay. Okay. However, uh, that's not to say that race isn't real, uh, because there is no biological signal of race. Doesn't mean that the concept, the social concept of race, and how we treat race uh, in the world is not real and doesn't have real biological consequences. So if we look at people who self-identify as white Americans versus black Americans and these biological consequences of being a member of that social construct of race. Um, uh, black Americans have a higher death rate. Uh, black Americans have a higher rate of coronary heart disease, have a higher rate of cancer death, have a higher infant, infant mortality rate, um, have a higher pregnancy-related maternal deaths, have a high, much higher uh, rate, uh, or a uh, much higher rate of pregnancy-related maternal deaths, um, much higher rate of uh, diagnosed diabetes, higher rate of obesity, and higher rate of unemployment. So these things, with the exception of unemployment, are biological consequences of the social construct of race. There's no denying that um, how uh, races are treated in America or any other country uh, is different. And if either a person identifies themselves as a member of that race or society identifies them as a member of that race, there are biological consequences uh, to being a member of that race. Even if, if we sequenced all these black Americans... Uh, there would be so they would be so variable that you could not tell them apart um, from white Americans in terms of how variable their DNA was. Um, that's not to say that uh, there isn't a uh, 
<clears throat> societal idea of being white or being black. And that societal idea of being white or black has um, definite biological consequences for the members of those groups. So is race real? Absolutely, uh, it's real. Does it have a biological impact on people? Absolutely. So race is a social construct that affects a person's biology in real ways, not the other way around. So there's no biological basis for race, um, but uh, there, the social construct of race has biological consequences. Um, let's look at some of those biological consequences of race and look at the data to say they are not genetically based. Okay, uh, if we look, uh, this is uh, some from uh, studies of people um, that live near Chicago and they looked at um, birth weight of uh, Americans uh, born uh, who are white and American born or uh, black and African uh, uh, immigrants. No, um, these two curves here uh, the tan curve and the purple curve, they overlap each other, no real difference in the distribution of birth weight. But if we look at um, black Americans, American-born uh, people who are black, significantly lower birth weight. Okay, so these authors uh, were out to show um, is this based on genetics? Is it based on environment? So they looked at three generations of mothers, white grandmothers in generation one um, and their birth weight uh, that were born in the U.S., white grandmothers born in Europe, black grandmothers born in the U.S., black grandmothers born in the Caribbean islands or Africa. And that's generation one. Then they looked at their uh, there, so that generation one is their birth weight, and then generation two is their uh, daughter's birth weight, and generation three is their granddaughter's birth weight. So in generation two, um, there is a big difference uh, between uh, black um, uh, babies born from African uh, um, or Caribbean immigrants and living in the United States versus uh, black Americans born um, who are Americans not immigrated to this uh, country and born in the United States. Black Americans born in the United States had a much lower birth weight. In generation three, uh, birth weight goes up. So after three generations, there is general uh, improvement in um, um, uh, pregnancy uh, nutrition and pregnancy education and that causes average birth weight to go up for all um, uh, babies significantly except for uh, the uh, the daughters of black Africans second generation so in the first generation when they immigrate to this country uh, not significantly different than uh, what is seen in whites. Compare all the G2s here. But in their second generation, um, significantly lower birth weights after they're in the United States. So uh, these are the same genetics, okay? Um, and just changing the environment, being born in the United States, uh, lowers birth weight. And you could argue that um, the, these people have similar ancestry and that they uh, have um, a, at least partially um, uh, black descendants, common black descendants, um, and, and yet uh, in a different social situation, whether or not you're born in the United States or you immigrate to the United States, has much bigger effect uh, uh, has a big effect on the birth weight of your babies. Now, uh, a criticism of the study was 
if you look at the sample size, which is this number n, much bigger sample sizes for these three groups than, than in this group. Um, but uh, this is a, a strong evidence that there's nothing genetic uh, uh, in terms of the signal that races, but there is something very strongly social affecting the biology of these um, different identified groups in that um, uh, black people immigrating to the United States after they've been in the United States, uh, their babies do worse in terms of birth rate, uh, birth weight um, than when they first in the first generation uh, coming to the United States. Um, so definitely environment, not genetics. Uh, this is a super interesting talk. There's a link to it in the book. It's only 14 minutes long. Uh, it's given by Dorothy Roberts, who's a sociologist and a lawyer. And she talks about her experience uh, as a black American, a black American who has a white father, and how she was identified in a study uh, that was... Uh, trying to use race as a predictor of certain um, outcomes in a medical uh, ex uh, medical trial. And she makes a very compelling argument about uh, race-based medicine is wrong-headed and is bad science and uh, uh, and it's um, and I'm assigning that and you watch that video and I will be asking you about it on the test. It's really um, important uh, talk. Okay, so race-based medicine, um, the idea is that there, again, there's some kind of genetic signal uh, in uh, races and we need to be aware of that genetic signal so that we can um, see how different races respond to uh, different drugs, common drugs, for example. And so people who are self-identifying as African American, white American, Hispanic American, or Asian American. Okay, So right there you can see uh, problems in that uh, are Hispanic Americans just uh, united by um, uh, language? Certainly lots of different countries uh, could be the origin of uh, anybody who considers themselves Hispanic, same for Asian. Um, and does this mean East Asian, South Asian? What does that mean? So that gives you a sense of the problem with trying to use some kind of social construct in a scientific sort of study. Um, and they looked at warfarin uh, dosage. So warfarin is a blood thinner. Um, it can give, be given to people uh, who have hypertension, high blood pressure, um, and the dose has to be uh, very tightly uh, monitored because too much warfarin and you'll have trouble clotting your blood, and too little could mean that you're more likely to have a stroke. Um, uh, so um, they looked at uh, dosage among races and they found this sort of difference uh, and in fact they saw this sort of trend among self-identified people in these different races. So it's easy to try to assume that there's some kind of signal here uh, based on race. Uh, but this is correlation. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, that there is a causation here. So most mornings I put on socks and most mornings uh, I have cereal for breakfast, but it's not that the socks cause me to have cereal. So because two things are correlated and one is associated with the other, doesn't mean one causes the other. Okay. Um, the, the, the genetic change the alleles that are different in the human population that cause people to have a different response to warfarin 
are um, uh, they have these names uh, C uh, CYP2C9 is the name of the gene and it has and these single nucleotide polymorphism genotypes within that gene either in a certain spot of that gene at that single nucleotide you have a GG a GA or an AA and um, and whether or not you have that genotype determines uh, the uh, type of dose that you typically get okay but whether or not you have that genotype uh, may be somewhat associated with a um, uh, race a uh, self-identified race but within Asians for example uh, you'll have every kind of genotype and within blacks you have every kind of genotype within whites you have every kind of genotype so uh, in the talk here that I want you to see uh, by, Do uh, by Dorothy Roberts um, uh, she makes the argument that medicine should not uh, take the shortcut of saying okay I'm a doctor and I see in front of me an Asian person and I automatically assume that they have this kind of uh, genotype and therefore I'm going to dose them with warfarin this particular way. Uh, instead they should take the time to figure out what is this person's genotype and what do, uh, dose should they get not just assume uh, because I am perceiving a certain race in front of me that that's the dose that they should get okay uh, a lot of race talks about skin color and there's certainly a lot of social const construct around skin color skin color among races and within, even within race. Um, there are different genes that are associated with uh, different skin colors. All of these genes evolved in the ancestral and African population from which all humans arise. And all of these genes are seen in all races, all so-called races. Um, so the darkest, uh, one of the darkest alleles um, is some of the oldest, um, and some of the lighter skins is some of the, excuse me, some of the newest um, or most recent uh, mutations. Um, and this is thought to be uh, associated with a selection for the environment that people found themselves in. So on the African plains, um, having uh, uh, dark skin mean you had less UV damage to your skin and so um, uh, less susceptible to um, uh, damage from the sun uh, in a place where there is a lot of sun. As humans migrated out of Africa, they migrated to some uh, parts that had a climate where there was much less sun. And in that case, uh, um, dark skin was a liability in that you need a certain amount of ultraviolet radiation to synthesize vitamin D, a very important uh, vitamin in your skin. Uh, and if you had really dark skin, you probably weren't getting enough vitamin D. And so there was selection for uh, lighter skin, uh, and those people survived. Um, so, but even within these uh, light skin variations and dark skin variations, you have all those alleles in all those populations. Uh, are any of these alleles not found in Africa? The answer is no. All these alleles are in Africa. And in fact, if you look at um, uh, uh, Native Africans and the, the variation in skin color, it's pretty dramatic across uh, the uh, continent of, of Africa. There's a study where they looked at um, variation in uh, how much melanin you have. Melanin is the pigment in the skin that makes skin uh, dark. And uh, across all kinds of different, um, uh, the whole continent of Africa. Um, and 
they found a uh, great variety uh, all across Africa. The skin color was measured under their upper arm so that it wouldn't be influenced on changes in melanin uh, as um, after exposure to sun. So this is an area that should be out of the sun and lots of variability all over the continent. So it's not like you just have one skin tone or another skin tone um, in Africa and all these alleles were, were there in Africa but probably uh, underwent different types of selection once humans left Africa. Okay, So within a uh, population, uh, lots of variability in melanin. Um, and the, the misconception that the authors are talking about is that, um, that native Africans in Africa have very dark skin. Uh, and uh, that's not necessarily true. It depends on uh, what part of Africa they're in, and there's uh, lots of variability. Um, another thing around this whole argument is how much uh, variation in genotype correlates with what we actually see in a phenotype. So genotype is the underlying genetic differences, and phenotype are, is what someone actually looks like. And those things where uh, things uh, look similar, like these two chimps, okay, they look very similar to us in our perceptions as humans, they actually have a lot more difference, um, uh, 10 times in terms of uh, genomic difference in, among individuals than two individual humans. So two individual humans, which humans looking at other humans, we would say these two individual humans look really different. Um, but they only have 0.1% of genomic differences among them. So uh, usually I get a question when we're face to face about this sort of thing and say, hey, are you saying that there's no, uh, nothing in the genome that can tell you what um, uh, somebody's skin is going to look like. And no, I'm not saying like saying that. So if you had an individual and you sequence that whole individual, there would be enough genetic information uh, there to give you an idea of how light that or how dark that person's skin was. However, that's not the same thing as saying this is the race of this person because there's all kinds of people who identify as white. There's all kinds of people who identify as black, and they have a great variety in their uh, skin tone. Um, and so uh, it may be able to tell you this is the skin tone of this individual, but could not tell you how that individual identifies uh, with their race. OK. So um, here are the numbers for uh, humans uh, that almost all of our DNA from one individual to the next is the same. 99.9% .9 is the same. Only 0.1% difference among individuals. And uh, compared to chimps, 98.8% um, is the same uh, among individual chimps and 1.2% difference uh, between the individuals, which is 10 times higher. Um, and the idea is that chimps evolved before humans. They've accumulated more DNA differences, uh, even though very few chimps are still alive. Humans have been on uh, the planet as a species uh, for less time than uh, chimps, and so we haven't accumulated as many differences in our genome by the various mechanisms of mutation, selection, drift, uh, all that stuff. Okay, so the bottom line about this stuff, there are no races among humans if you look at someone's whole genome. There's so much variation uh, within what someone would self-identify as a race that you can't say between here and here is this race and between here and here is that race. All the races overlap. Um, so you can't distinguish among them at a genetic level. However, that's not to say race isn't real. 
Uh, socially, race has huge and dramatic consequences on human biology. Um, and uh, it's not to say at all or to ne deny someone's race uh, at all. It's just that science has been used in the past to try to make a genetic argument about the superiority of one race or the inferiority of another race. There is no evidence for that whatsoever. No matter what kind of characteristic you want to pick, there's just no definition. Uh, there's no support for that at all. Um, but that's not to say that someone shouldn't be proud to be a member of a race and proud of their social connections among their race, or that uh, one race should deny the struggles of another race. Um, that's not true. Those, but those are social consequences, uh, are social constructs, something that humans have constructed in, uh, as social beings. But, but they also have very real biological consequences in terms of uh, one race not having the same environment as another race has real biological consequences and it makes differences in terms of disease, uh, in terms of access to health care, access to good nutrition. Uh, all those things are real. It's just that uh, if, if you run into someone trying to make a genetic argument about the superiority of one race or another, or that it's all just biology uh, uh, explaining a difference, some kind of stereotypical difference that they're trying to explain between one race and another. That's total baloney. Uh, there's absolutely no data for that at all. However, um, there is very strong data that the social system we have set up around race has real biological consequences for people who self-identify for that race.